Hi, I'm Russ Segner. We put this series together to feature narrow gauge layouts, seldom seen because they are not located in cities where we normally visit for national narrow gauge conventions. Thanks to the organizing committee of Jerry Cornwell, Pete Smith, Mark Lachey, Dave Adams, and Jeff Schultz. Information in this program is available at NNG at groups Dot io. We hope you will join us. So now for our program. Our next presenter is going to be Maureen Hunter and Rick, and uh, they should be ready uh, to share their screen. And I've made Maureen co-host. So Maureen, are you there? I'm here. There you are. Okay. So uh, share your screen and take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are, I am Rick Hunter, and this is my fantastic wife, Maureen. Um, we own Hunter Line from Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. We want to go through briefly what Hunter Line is all about. And then after about 10, 15 minutes, we're going to actually take you through a clinic and do everything right in front of you, which is what we do at a show. Uh, we do a lot of shows. We do uh, about 20 shows a year from coast to coast. If it's a national show, we're usually there. We're going to go through a, a series of uh, slides here to show you exactly what our models actually look like. Uh, we use uh, basswood uh, from Mount Albert. Hi, Jerry. And uh, you can see some of them are quite complicated, but we try and ease that through our, our uh, instructions and our drawings. You can see everything is color coded. N scale is orange and HO is blue, S is yellow and O is green. Uh, at the show, you can see that Maureen is at the front table there. We do clinics right there and then. And Maureen is always building one of our layouts right in front of you all the time. People really like this because they can go back in an hour or two and see, oh, okay, you're gone this far. And they always wonder why we can't finish by the end of the show. The one that she's got right there on that one, that's about 60 or 70 hours worth. And it's pretty hard to do that at a show. But we get to converse a lot with uh, our customers and they get to ask questions and, and we learn and they learn. So there's color combinations, the way we uh, do it. Our big kits are actually in big boxes, so you just can't put those in the, in the plastic sleeves. This is what our drawings look like. I'm in AutoCAD, uh, and we uh, take you know the real world measurements and put them in AutoCAD, and then the rest is whatever scale we're doing. It's just a mathematical uh, calculation to do it. <laughs> Our instructions are very detailed. Uh, we assume you know nothing. Uh, our first page is usually a history of what the model does. Uh, and then the next two or three pages are techniques and methods that we use to get there. And then this is a, an example of our, uh, our drawings. You can see that the parts, they're, they're, because they're actual size, of the of the scale, you build everything right on the drawing. You can see there that um, there's wax paper over top of the drawing. This is an old method, but it sure works. This is the, the top two pictures there. That's what we're going to be doing a little later. We like how bridges. Um, you can see that most of our kits are bridges and some other trackside structures, but these are our hows, and they are extremely to prototype. That's what it looks like on the layout. Now, some of these pictures are actually our customers' layouts. Like, that's not our layout, that's one of our customers. And you can see they got the how through bridge, the how deck bridge, and you can see in the center there, it's got our piers. There's a little closer look. This is our uh, 86 foot how deck bridge on a layout. We like this picture because it shows all the NBWs and all the, the uh, things that are right close up that you can see. All our wires are phosphorus bronze. Uh, we find that phosphorus bronze is very user friendly. 
Uh, it's not like piano wire or brass wire. Once it's kinked, it's, it's done with. But phosphorus bronze is very easy. You can just give it a little snap in place and away it goes. But you can see all the MBWs, different sizes. They're all in the kit. A couple of years ago, uh, we were asked for covered bridges. So we produced this covered bridge. That's on the left is uh, standard gauge and on the right is narrow gauge. Yes, we do narrow gauge. That's what it looks like on a layout. Mm -hmm. And you can see the shakes there. That's our own shakes. Uh, we searched all over the world trying to get shakes that uh, we were happy with and nobody made them. So we decided to make our own. That is the only laser parts that we have. Everything else is made of strip wood. And there's what the shakes look like. They come on a sheet. There's virtually no waste. Our trestles. And one of the great things about our trestle is you can build them on any curve you want. Um, we've done so many make and take clinics on this that we decide to document how to make the curve. And so our uh, documentation on that, it works for any radius at all. And uh, you don't usually fail with, with our instructions on that. There is what one looks like on a layout. We're one of the few in the world to actually make a snow shed. Um, us in the East, we don't really have these, but in the West, they're all over the place. Uh, this is actually a mile 24 of the Quokohala subdivision on the CPR. And there it is on a layout. Now this fellow decided to make it on a curve. Power to you, if you can do it, go for it. This is our first models that we ever started with. It's the King Post and the, the Queen Post Bridge. There's what a queen post looks like. And we also make a tunnel liner. I don't think anybody else makes a tunnel liner. Again, this is on the CPR spiral tunnel. It's in British Columbia. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's about uh, uh, in the 1930s, up until the 1930s, and then they replaced it with concrete. And there's a little portal and retaining wall. The retaining wall actually produces twice as much as what you see there. To me, tin walls are funny because you can build them any way you want, like one big one or a whole bunch of little ones, whatever you want. And there's the, the portal and retaining wall and that's going into the snow shed. This is a, our snow fences. Uh, because we do so much traveling, we see thousands and thousands of snow sheds. And I don't think anybody's ever made them into a kit. So we decided to make them into a kit. Uh, there's the, the real one on the left and our kit on the right. This is a one night uh, project. It um, takes maybe two, two and a half hours to produce them. Maureen, Maureen takes care of the weathering mix. Okay. So the other part of our business is the weathering mix and um, we manufacture that ourselves here, bottle by bottle. It's uh, the base is 70% isopropyl alcohol and we mix all our colors with different leather dyes. And there's the 45 colors that we have. Uh, four of them are a pigment, so it's a little bit thicker um, stain than the uh, regular one that's, ones that we have. I'll talk a little bit more about the pigments in a little while. That's just what it looks like at a show um, when we're set up and little samples of the wood stains yeah, just, above. Just in that picture, uh, you can see all the, the bottles are labeled with a little colored label. Uh, over the years, we have had so much trouble reproducing that uh, on a printer because every time you print it, it's a different color. And everybody says, okay, the color that we're using is not what is on the bottle. So what we've done is we, and this is Maureen's bright idea. So she took the bottle and we actually have a piece of the wood on it. That's an old scale one by 12. And that's actually out of this bottle. So there's, that's an exact color match. And we just started producing them that way. It's actually cheaper to produce them in the wood than it is to print them on a, a big printing machine. So all these mm -hmm. pictures that you're gonna see here are um, customers that have sent in some of their models and they've used our weathering stains to uh, weather them. This, uh, the weathering <coughs> the wood, that's what we intended it to be used for, but people kept coming back and saying, oh, you know, it worked well in plastic. 
So we tried it out and yeah, it works on a lot of different things. You just have to be creative and, and try it. It works on wood, hydrocal, plastic, paper, uh, fabric, all sorts of things. The only thing I think that we found that it doesn't is any kind of um, yeah, die cast because of the baked on enamel. Yeah. Um, but this is one of a 3D printer crawler um, that someone sent in and he used our sandalwood brown, light gray and dark brown to get that effect that you see turned out pretty well. And this is a box car um, that someone has used the uh, our creosote black and just dry brushed that in varied areas over the uh, over the rivets and, and the nice. <coughs> it really accents all those uh, all those things. Just turns that basic um, simple box car into a little bit more interesting structure. And this is something, another structure someone sent in and they used our yellow cream on that little building. I think this was all on basswood. Um, and he used a light gray to just um, dry brush under the eaves and a little bit up from the bottom where you might see a little bit darker shading or a little bit of moisture. And the building um, just, a J, just below that yellow uh, building is uh, Hunter Green. Uh, he used Hunter Green stain to get that effect. And the staircase, I think, is in light gray. And um, I think the wall adjacent to the yellow building is our boxcar brown. And I think he just used a little bit of sandpaper to strip away some of the stain to give it that effect. And here's another structure where the fellow used uh, driftwood as a base coat and used our creosote black to uh, do that darker. Um, he did some dry brushing to get those darker effects on the building and also dark brown and cordobon and sandalwood brown. Dry brushing really, really adds some great effect. And here's a neat little structure, um, combinations of our driftwood, blue gray and raw sienna, who's done uh, those strip boards in different colors. And here it is used on rock. Um, the pigments that I was talking about that are a little bit um, thicker are great for mortar mortar line so you can use it on even plastic buildings that have just plain um, bricks scribed on the on the plastic just put the uh, pigment on and wipe it off very quickly with a paper towel or a sponge and it leaves great mortar lines same here with the rock and then I think he used different colors to to touch up some of those rocks to get varied varied colors I think he used medium brown and sandalwood brown golden brown and light gray one of our points about the pigment uh, stains that we have uh, we wanted to put a light stain over top of a dark stain, which is virtually impossible. So we added a pigment into our stains so that you can do that. Now, sometimes you wipe it off and sometimes you just put it straight on. And here this lady um, found that using our sky blue, which is a pigment, worked well for her oil paintings. It was cheaper to use our stuff on the sky and the water than it was to use it in oil. <laughs> And here's a styrene structure someone did with our PT green. And the baseboards um, on the basement there are done with our cordobon brown. And I think a little bit of dry brushing with the creosote black. And here's our covered bridge. Um, I used, uh, I just turned the bridge upside down and those shakes came out really nice. I, I put a base coat of driftwood on and then used some cordobon brown and creosote black, just dry brush them here and there to get that effect. And the walls of that covered bridge are done with a base coat of driftwood and again cordovan brown and creosote black. One of the neat effects we found with the shakes, we actually used the burnt side to, to, on the good side and the good side goes down because uh, all the little tabs are actually scorched just a little bit and that gives out a really neat weathering effect. Mm -hmm. And here's Here's another uh, covered bridge where I put light gray as the base coat on those uh, side walls and dry brush barn red and use the creosote black again um, under, the, under the eaves and up the bottom. And here's the tie stringer assembly, which I'm gonna go through in a couple of minutes now. Um, just, I, I, I use different colors. I use about three different colors or four different colors to do all those ties. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes. 
And I guess that's it for that part. Okay, thanks. Now we'll switch over to doing the clinic. I don't know if anybody has any questions about any of what you've just seen. So we've, over the years, wondered how do you do ties, like like uh, prefab ties aren't the right color. And, and uh, a lot of times you just don't get that right color. So we've done in our travels a lot of uh, walking lines. We walk along, we look at the ties, we've taken pictures of them and so on. And we found out that, you know, every tie is a little different color. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a base color along any particular line or anything like that. So um, Maureen's going to tell you exactly what we're doing here. Well, I'm putting out three of the colors I'm going to use for, for this set of uh, ties. I'm using a driftwood, a cordovan brown, which is a little bit darker than the driftwood, and then a tie brown, which is really dark. And then I have my creosote black, which is going to be the wash that I'm going to put on at the end just to cohere all those different colors. So what I usually do is I just distress all those ties first. So I just use a, a razor saw and distress the ties. Can you see that okay? I don't know. So I just use a fair amount of pressure to distress them. And then I'll throw a handful of ties in each of those colors. You notice mine's got gloves on. Yeah, it's gloves kind on. of recommended when you're dealing <laughs> with uh, the alcohol and the, and the leather dyes that you use gloves. And if you've got tiny parts, like if I'm doing an N scale or an HO um, kit, I will use this little metal strainer to put the ties in and just dunk it in the uh, weathering mix and it works really well and then pop them out on a paper towel to dry. So the longer they sit in the bath, the dark, darker they're gonna get. Yeah. You notice she used the same brush on each one. We don't wash brushes. We, we don't, uh, we just let that, that's all part of, the, <laughs> of doing it. <laughs> so, I'll just pop them out on the paper towel. Just mix them up. It doesn't matter where they where they are. You just want to do it very randomly. There we go. One more. Oh. It dries pretty quickly because of the alcohol. I've already started a. a Stringer assembly here. You, you notice the drawing there and there's nice wax paper on it. We had one fellow that didn't use wax paper and wow, what a mess. <laughs> so just spread them out, let them let them dry, which I'm going to do right there. I've got some already colored and dried here. And usually when I'm doing the stringer assembly, I put on every fourth tie and then just go back and glue my um, other ties in between. So I know there's three ties in between. So I'll put a strip of glue. A lot of people want to start at one end of the ties and go to the other. No, the whole thing is to get the assembly rigid. So once it's rigid, then you can go back at your leisure and put everything on. And if you do every fourth tie, it's easier because you just put three ties in between, use your eyeball, don't use the drawing. And if they look right, let them dry. Yeah, so just get them on. And I would, of course, remove my excess glue here between those ties. I usually use a little um, uh, tweezer and it will usually take that glue right out. But anyway, I just want to show you the different colors here. So I'll put these on. So I've got the driftwood, the cordovan, and the tie brown, and I'm just laying them out here haphazardly. You see that okay? I think it's come through okay, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. So I would ordinarily just let that set up and dry. 
you don't have to use the same colors that we just did. You, you yeah. Take the one you're trying to model and uh, just see exactly what colors or close colors that, that, that we have that you can uh, uh, put this together with. Yeah, you could use light gray goes nicely as well. So if you had some in a light gray bath, some in a creosote black bath, um, you could also throw in a medium brown, whatever, dark brown, whatever you choose. And what's really neat about our bottles is they actually become weights. Like each bottle is eight ounces. So uh, there's your weights. You don't have to have anything special for that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so I would let that dry up and then go back and use my black, creosote black as a wash. We call it creosote black. It doesn't mean it's creosote. It just means that it's black. And we use it as a black wash on just about everything that we have. So this is, this is where the big difference comes in. So just take your brush and put it right in the bottle, take it right out of the bottle and just take your black. You can do this over. with a dry brush too, but we, yeah. for this, we like a wet brush because then it, it soaks through. And this just kind of brings the colors together. It ties them together. It's gonna dry lighter, of course. I've got one finished that I can show you. We always say be quick. If it takes longer than two or three seconds, that's too long. <laughs> it doesn't take long. And then I would let that dry. I remember things on a railroad are oily, greasy, sooty, crappy stuff. And that's why we always finish with really, really dark colors, be it our clear soap black or, or tie brown. Mm -hmm. Ty brown, this, yeah. is, this is Thai brown. They're the darkest colors we have. And I'm going to just take that straight out of the bottle and take it down the middle of that track. Where the oil would be dripping. And just if you want it darker, just put more coats on. But the dark color, the black or the Thai brown, coheres all the ties together. So it's, it's certainly not hard and it's pretty quick. Now that'll dry a little bit lighter. It looks pretty dark now, but here's one. I don't know if you can see that very well. That's one that's finished and it's, let me see, it's basically the same, same colors that I used right there. Okay. And that's it. Pretty quick. Is there anything I forgot? No, I think that's about it. Yeah. Is okay. there any questions about that? <clears throat> Maureen, this is Russ Signer. I was curious if you've got some tips for us on some of the assemblies that you have, uh, little tricks of the trade. For, for, the, for the one I'm just doing now, for the stringer uh, assembly? No, I'm thinking actually of the bridge structures themselves. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, actually, uh, we're going to do a couple clinics for you in the near future where we're going to take uh, some some of those step by step by step. Okay. But for, but for this one, if you'd like to, to know, I like I just, when I'm doing my kits, um, when I'm starting to build, I, I put down my plans on a really flat board, just tape them down and then put the wax paper over top so that when you're gluing directly right on the drawing, it doesn't stick. And that really works well. I'm sure that you probably all know those tricks, but but that's what I, I do for that. Um, what else for this well, particular? The very first step we always do is, is um, to stress the wood and then stain it with the base color. Okay, like in this case, we had three base colors. Um, and we don't usually do the highlight until right when the whole model is finished. And then we put the black or the tie brown around uh, and, and let it drizzle down, like let mother or let gravity do it, you know? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Mm. But in future, in future ones of these, we will be doing a lot of getting right into the uh, techniques. 
Well, we'll talk about the, doing the MBWs and yeah. that sort of thing, which um, can be frustrating sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Rick, I used a lot of the uh, weathering mix on my scenery too. It came out really well. Yeah. And there's a product called Rubber Rocks, which I use a lot of on my layout, and it works good on that too. So, yeah, good oh, stuff. Good. Well, so that's a new one, rubber rocks. That's a good, mm -hmm. yeah, good. That's great. I, so to read it, Maureen, I love your stains. Uh, I'm pretty new to building wood kits and I bought some from you to show and it, it worked so well. So thank you, it's good stuff. Oh, good. Oh, so you got, you got your little mascot there. We have our security system back here. Uh, you probably can't see her, but. <laughs> well, actually, actually, to, to be honest, Rick, when you're talking about alcohol in your, in your um, stains, I went and made myself a martini. And um, I'm, I'm holding a cap because he's trying to drink my martini. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, mine's only coffee. Oh. All right. Well, thank you very much, you guys. Uh, we always enjoy your work when we see it at the, at the shows. I remember, though, the last time I bought a bunch of the bottles of the stain, I was taking them up to the room. And uh, I had a sack that tore open. I thought, oh, crap, it's going to hit the floor and shatter. <clears throat> Fortunately, oh. your bottles are plastic. <laughs> yeah, they're plastic. Well, the, the, <laughs> the bottles are plastic, which is really good. But the lid is a rigid plastic. And if it hits lid first, it's gone. Um, we can uh, take you to all places all over the United States where people have dropped them, OK? and. Uh, the stains are still there. You can tell where we've been. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, you guys, <clears throat> for coming. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this. We look forward to seeing you again. The next session will be posted on the group's IONNG several days before the next program. Look for the link there.